Welcome to the Idea Pod, a podcast dedicated to exploring and interrogating applied ethics at the University of Leeds. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Idea Pod. I'm Graham Bex Priestley, a lecturer at the Idea Centre, and today I'm joined by chartered accountant Ken Lutuk from Canada, who also lived many years in Houston. And your first degree was in theology, and then you got an MBA at Harriet Watt in Edinburgh. And recently, you've completed a master's with us in applied and professional ethics. Uh, hi, Ken. Hi, Graham. Good to be with you. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, yeah, so the topic of today's episode is going to be business ethics and in particular responsibility for corporate failures. So Ken, what drove you to choose business ethics in the first place? Actually, a few things. So one is um, I think the, the area is extraordinarily important. Right now, if you look at, uh, say, the 100 biggest economies in the world, over half are going to be corporations. Tremendous amount of significance. Uh, if you look at where people are employed, tremendous amount of people um, are employed by, by corporations. So it has a certain significance to it. There's also an academic um, reason also. You know, in our module on business ethics, uh, Professor McGowan wrote something that uh, he said that he thought that the, the academic study of business ethics had been somewhat superficial. And he proposed that perhaps the reason was because it's very difficult to have an understanding of, of ethics, but also an understanding of business. And I completely agree with him. You know, sometimes I've, I went through journals on business ethics and I read some of the articles and I think to myself, well, that was really interesting, but that would never work in reality. It's clear that person has never been in a corporation. And then sometimes I would go on a, you know, a professional conference and there'd be a speaker on business ethics and it might be, uh, a professional, probably a lawyer, uh, often, and the level of discourse is like Sunday school ethics. You know, they might know the business, they might know their profession, but they've never addressed the questions that I addressed to the level that we did in the Leeds program. So I thought, you know, maybe this is something that I can make a small contribution in bringing my experience and, of course, my academic preparation at Leeds and, and do a paper. As far as Enron, <clears throat> well, that's that's a bit of an interesting story. So one thing about Enron is it's an iconic case study. You go to our module on business ethics, and in the first sentence, in the introduction, you will see the name Enron. So to this day, it is still a very important case study. It's a little it's bit unique for me because I actually worked for Enron for a short period of time, including the months towards uh, just before it collapsed. So I kind of had a front row seat to uh, to the story that, that you know, underpinned uh, my dissertation. And, of course, being in Houston at the time, if you did not work for Enron, if you did not work for Arthur Anderson, you know someone who worked for Enron or who worked for Arthur Anderson, and you saw the impact it made on, on, on Houston. So, again, I thought, you know, maybe having that front row seat, I could provide a filter and a slightly different perspective than maybe others could. So taking an important topic, taking my experience and iconic case study kind of made a lot of sense. Great. Yeah, thanks. Yes, yeah, so there's some really good points there. First of all, you mentioned how uh, corporations are can be as big as countries when it comes to um, the size of them and their economy and, and so on. So their, their impact is huge. And yet it seems as though we focus a lot more on countries and the way that they're run and have more of this sort of idea about what politics should be in a country more than in a workplace. Um, now, you said that you mentioned Enron because you were working there. Um, and I know that that was the focus of, uh, that was the main case study you focused on in your work. So just for our, our listeners, could you summarize what happened with Enron? Yeah, so uh, that's a little difficult to summarize, but I'll just give a very, very high level view. So Enron at the time was one of the largest, arguably the most prestigious, and a new economy company. 
uh, it was king of the hill, so to speak. <clears throat> um, if you worked at Enron, you were considered, you know, to quote the name of the book, one of the smartest guys in the room. There was something in Houston that was known as the Enron Swagger, that if you were employed by this company, you just had a level of confidence that other people did not. You kind of get, you kind of get the picture I'm, I'm trying to paint. Uh, then overnight, the company dissolved, just went bankrupt overnight. So it's an accounting story. So you have an accounting failure. But you also had what Enron was doing in California. Enron was primarily a trading organization. And when California deregulated their electricity markets, Enron went in and started to manipulate the markets in ways that at that time largely were legal, but created a lot of pain for people. We're talking other companies going bankrupt. We're talking senior citizens having to decrease their air conditioning in 100 degree heat because they couldn't afford the electricity bills. We're talking dairies having to throw out their milk because they couldn't afford to keep it cool. We're talking that kind of pain. And they did this just because they could to make money. That was California. Um, <clears throat> so then you say, well, okay, that's, that's, that's a business case study, but what happened from a moral perspective? Well, of course, a lot has been written, but if you look at the narrative that came out of that, the narrative that came out of that was basically a few bad apples. The narrative is, you had a few executives and a few others that were not deterred by criminal penalties and took a chance to enrich themselves and they went a bit too far and brought the house down. That was the primary narrative coming out of that. The argument I make in my, my paper is that just doesn't make sense. That's not the right explanation for what happened. The true explanation was really cultural and context. And that the moral response coming out of Enron was not adequate because it, it viewed it from the perspective of bad apples and not bad barrels or bad orchards. And, you know, I think I think there's evidence to support that. Evidence to support the, the picture of how people how people were responding in the first place um, that... to support the picture that it wasn't individuals who right, right, right. caused it, but issues of culture. Yeah, yeah. so you, you talk a lot in your paper about uh, methodological individualism, and you're very critical of this way of looking at the world. Um, so so what, what is met methodological individualism, and uh, where does it come from? Because it seems to be very pervasive in a society. Whenever something bad happens, we try and identify who it is, the person or the, the individuals to blame, and we're only satisfied when we when we find them and punish them. Um, yeah, so what is this view and, and where does it come from? Yeah, so the term was coined by uh, economist Joseph Schumpter, um, I believe, in the early 1900s. And the theory was this. Um, the theory was that if you want to try to understand an organization, you have to understand the actions of the organization. And that the actions of the organization are always reducible to the actions of the individual. Therefore, if you understand the actions of the individual, you just add these up and you'll get an understanding of the organization. So that is basically methodological individualism. It's a framework from which you analyze an organization to understand it. <clears throat> so... Why am I critical of it? It's often wrong. Is quite <laughs> frankly the the issue. Let me give you let me give you an example. Um, this was not my dissertation, um, but ash lines. This was from a psychologist, I think, in the early 1950s on ash lines. So what he did was he he got um, a print and he had lines of different lengths. And they're clearly, this was an illusion. It was quite clear that certain lines were shorter than other lines. This was the type of thing that if you ask 100 people which line was shorter, you would get the correct response 100 times. It was, it was that clear. So he did an experiment. He got four people in the room. Uh, but the unique thing is three of them were actors. Only one person was real. The first three people 
gave a wrong response to the question, which line is shorter? That fourth person gave the wrong answer 75% of the time. Following the head, basically. Yeah. Right. Well, how do you explain the behavior of that fourth person without seeing the interrelationship of the behavior of the other three? You can't. And this is a simple, which line is, is shorter question, right? So just think right. how difficult it gets when you get all these other contextual factors in, in trying to describe, describe behavior. So I'm not saying, and I did not say in the paper, that methodological individualism is always wrong. I'm just saying in the case of Enron, and by the way, in many, 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 I could even argue the majority of business ethics cases, it's the wrong primary approach to follow because you ignore culture and you ignore, you ignore context, which often is the driving force and behind what is going on. Good. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I mean, some of it in, in your paper, you mentioned how there's um, an element that it comes from Kant and the Enlightenment and these values where we should treat people as the author of their actions. And so if they are, they're the one person who can control what they do. Um, we're not determined by outside influences. We, you know, even though 75% of people may have reported what their other people were saying, the actors, they might say, well, look, still 25% refused and they didn't. So it shows they have free will and that they have this uh, autonomy. And so they are ultimately responsible for their actions. Um, due to that. Um, is, is this something that you would still want to resist, this line of thought? Yeah, so, I mean, let's just go back to the, the Ash Lines discussion. Yeah. So, so we've observed, right, that three people got it wrong, and then the fourth person got it wrong. So then let's say, well, okay, so let's just deal with the fourth person and say, well, okay, should we morally blame you for getting it wrong? Well, the person could say no. If I had been on my own, if I had totally acted as an autonomous individual, as in the context when you showed it to me individually, I would have got the answer right. Therefore, I should not be blamed. I was not acting as an autonomous individual agent. And then you say, well, yeah, maybe we should blame the other three uh, for, the, for the fact that the fourth person got it wrong. And the other three are going to say, but no. We did not force this person to give the wrong answer. We did not coerce them. We did not coach them in any way. What that person did was their free will. See, this is what corporate agency looks like. Once you unpack the situation, it doesn't make sense to blame anyone. <laughs> right, that's going to that's gonna feel really odd, right? Lots of people are going to think, hold on a minute. If we can't blame the people who broke the law or wangled things in ways they shouldn't and bent the rules. Who are we going to blame? It's just, oh, no one's to blame. Isn't that just really convenient for all the people involved? You no, know, it's a good question. So let's <clears throat> let's unpack that. So there's a, a quote I heard years ago. I do not know uh, where it's from. But it's about the corporation. So, you know, part of the problem with the corporation is that it has no soul to be damned nor body to be kicked. Hmm. And we seem to have this moral impulse for retribution, that when something goes wrong, we want that eye for an eye. We want that soul to damn. We want that body to kick. And so <clears throat> something goes wrong in a corporation. It's like we have to blame someone. We have to find that, that person. But I think that good philosophy challenges some of these moral intuitions. Does it make sense to blame someone? You know, uh, it was attributed to Gandhi. I don't know if that's accurate, but an eye for an eye leaves us both blind. Yeah. D does this, you know, impulse for retribution, <clears throat> is that really a moral impulse? Right. Um, so essentially, you want to move away from this idea of blaming for retributive purposes. Um, this is not the kind of picture that you think is beneficial. And so ultimately you move to something a bit more focused on consequences, right? It's not like you want to get rid of anything and just go on as before. Um, you think that there are 
things to be done, but you have a different version of blame, right? I'm <clears throat> yeah. So I'm a I'm a dedicated consequentialist in in my moral philosophy. So let's 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 bring this back to Enron for a moment. Um, I think this might make some sense. So let's say, and we'll keep this very simple. But let's say you know we're we're past Enron and we have to figure out what we're going to do. And interestingly, Jeff Skilling. Um, the CEO of Enron was a graduate of Harvard Business School. It was also interesting that a number of the executives also studied or graduated from Harvard Business School. One might think that where these people learned their practice of business, the values that they learned, all this stuff, like maybe you would sit back and reflect was in some way Harvard Business School or the curriculum that they had been delivering that was being delivered in a lot of other business schools too. Was there some responsibility there in a causal sense, right? You might want to do that. And then you might want to say like, you might make some pretty big changes in how, in what you teach or how you teach it. And then you look at Jeff Skilling and say, well, we definitely don't want him to do that again. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and so you might make it um, impossible for him to, uh, to ever, uh, have a leadership position in business again or something like that, right? So what have you done here? You've, you've stopped that person from harming others in that way again, right? Um, and you've gone back to some of the causes that it could, you know, the context, the culture, the values that could have caused this. Okay, that seems very reasonable. So now let's talk about what was done. Well, according to a book by Duff McDonald called The Golden, the Golden Passport, uh, he looked at Harvard Business School, and there's a whole chapter on Enron. After Enron, there was no serious reflection upon what was taught at Harvard Business School. That didn't happen. What happened to Jeff Skilling? He was put into jail for 24 years. A middle-class finance guy put into jail for 24 years. You had to get your pound of flesh out of Jeff Skilling, right? And yet nothing happened in the school and the way that things are taught. So from a consequentialist position, you know, perspective, you say, really, was this the moral path forward to basically ignore the, the values that would have shaped the person who committed the un inappropriate behavior? And really, what benefit is it to anyone to stick him into jail for 24 years. And by the way, according to reports in, in the paper and such, he still does not accept that he did anything wrong. Wow. Why, 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 what was his um, reasoning process? Is he just that he was doing his job and that was his job to make profit? It's interesting. So if you go to the, the movie, um, there's one clip from the movie where um, he's testifying before Congress. And uh, he says, I did nothing that was not in the best interest of the shareholders of the corporation. Excellent. So, so yeah. Milton Friedman. <laughs> yeah. You know where that was going, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is a really, really nice segue, right, into the role of the corporation. And, and that's, that's going to be part of it, right? If we're going to think about what they're responsible for, we've got to think about what they're for in the first place. So why do corporations exist? What is their role? What responsibilities do they have? Um, so yeah, tell me about Friedman. This is uh, something that's had a massive influence, um, especially especially since the 80s in both our countries, right? Um, Thatcher, Major, Blair over here, and, and hasn't really stopped. The, and over in your country, we had Reagan and continued by Clinton, this whole sort of privatize, deregulate ideology, which has been quite prominent. Um, and some of it was influenced by some of Friedman's theories. So, yeah, so what is Friedman's shareholder theory? Yeah, so, um, you know, very simply, I mean, his most influential, largely influential writing was an article in the New York Times in 1970 called something to the effect of the social responsibility of businesses to increase profits. Right. And I think the title pretty much, you know, um, explains what the article was about. So if 
I'll, I'm going to start out and just be like a very charitable, um, you know, explanation or dig it down. So Friedman, following from Friedrich Hayek, who was an economist, uh, as was Friedman. And you have to remember, Friedrich Hayek, um, his thought had been developed over the period of the war years. And, you know, he had seen and experienced kind of what government tyranny could be on individuals. And he was very much a liberal, a liberal in the European sense, right? The sacredness of the individual, which also ties into property rights. Yeah. So the individual, the property of the individual, that is in some sense sacred and should not be infringed upon. Okay. So then there's also duty. <clears throat> so for example, um, if I own my house and I hire you to come and look after my house for a week and I say, okay, Graham, when you look after my house, no parties in the house, then it's your duty not to party in my house. It's my house and it's your duty not to party in it, right? If all of a sudden you go and have a party in my house, that's wrong. Well, see, this is what he's essentially saying in his article, right? If you're a manager in the company, you are being hired by the shareholders of the company who own that company. You shouldn't be partying in the house. If you want to go and, and get involved in all your little charitable things and all your little pastimes, you should do that on your dime. Don't party in my house is what Friedman is essentially, essentially saying. So, so there's that's there's a lot of good to be said out of that sort of a view of Friedman. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think liberalism is somewhat under attack today. And I think it's, we're going to, we're going in a very dangerous place, um, going too far down that road. That being said, okay, so what was the problem with, um, with Friedman? So <clears throat> let's go back to Aristotle for a second and say, well, okay, Aristotle said that the greatest good is well-being. So individually, what does well-being look like? Well, you need money. He said that. But you also need other things. You need great friends and leisure, and you need all of these things in proper balance, and that creates a happy life. Well, a corporation, of course, is a legal person, but it also does have, in some ways, yeah, characteristics of a real person. So think what it is like if if we took um, the Aristotle view of well-being and put it on top of the corporation. Well, then the, the purpose of the corporation won't be about making money because the making money is not the greatest good. I mean, just think what it would be like if you're an individual and the only thing that motivated you was to make more money. Everything you did 24 hours a day was either sleeping so you could wake up and make more money or making the money or thinking about how to make more money. And if you couldn't make more money, they'd be there counting the amount of money that you made. That would be a very, that would be a psychopath of some sort, right? I mean, that would not be a mentally stable person. Well, some of our corporations are acting just like that. As sort of these monetary psychopaths where the, the most important thing is money. It, you're either making money, trying to make more, or counting what you have. Well, see, that's the problem. Because all of a sudden, all these other values that the corporation influence fall by the wayside. If I can externalize my pollution and harms the environment, I increase profit, that's okay. Right. So, I mean, this, this seems to be what a lot of people might be worried about is that really what the, the issue is, there's going to be certain harms that, that might come from a company maximizing profits. So even if it was just focused on maximizing profits, they might say, well, that's OK, because really it's the humans which are going to benefit from the increase in dividends or whatever it is that the company does. And then they can live their lives in a way that isn't focused on profit. Um, they can spend their money doing nice things. But then you, you might think, well, but what's the corporation doing in its pursuit of profit? Are there any harms that are going to come as a result of that? And in the case of Enron, of course, lots of harms 
<laughs> did result from from the, the pursuit of profit. Um, so do you think that they're linked? Go ahead. I was just going to say it. So do you think these two things are, are linked, or um, is it really just this issue of if we should if you, if you treat the corporation as a person flourishing in the way that Aristotle would like, then really it should be focused on a broader set of goals than profit. So um, I did write a paper on this, not not in my dissertation, in another module. And I I analogize to professional ethics. So let's say you're a doctor. One of the you know basic moral tenets of medicine, or as a professional, is do no harm. Okay, that's I think a good place to be. But then the other thing about that is if you're a doctor. We shouldn't go and say, hey, you need to be a doctor half the time. Oh, but you need to carve out 20 percent of your time and be an accountant. Well, you're not an accountant, you're a doctor. So if you go to what your purpose is, you need to stick about your purpose and serve that purpose without doing harm. Seems like a reasonable path forward. So then what does it mean then if we take that into the corporation? Well, the purpose of the corporation is to generate profit. That is the purpose of the corporation. So arguably, it should not be going too far outside of that purpose. Okay, here comes Milton Friedman, right? Don't go too far out of that purpose. But in serving that purpose, the ethical position is do no harm. So you shouldn't be harming your employees. You shouldn't be harming your customers. You shouldn't be harming the environment. Now, there's a difference, right? Because let's say I have a business that has nothing to do with energy, for example. My business should not harm the environment, but that doesn't mean I have an obligation to try and solve the climate crisis. That might not be what I do. That might be what someone else does, and they should be doing that. We talk about COVID-19. We have people who know how to create vaccines. That's what they should be doing. We shouldn't have people that don't know how to do that attempting to do it. You follow your purpose, right? But in following that purpose, you do no harm. Right, and so that's the difference. It's, um, yeah, so we have people who think about corporate social responsibility as these little side projects or um, charitable projects that sometimes might make a company look good. Um, some people might say it's greenwashing, for instance. Um, but you're essentially saying look, that that's not the responsibility. If they want to do that, that's fine, but the responsibility is not to harm. So it could be harming their environment. It could be damaging, well, people's electricity, for instance, um, whatever it is that we just need to make sure that we don't do any harm. And that goes beyond what Friedman was saying, right? Because Friedman was saying maximize profits within the law and was not focused so much on harm. No, no, he was he was not. He was not. Um, that, that was not. And even in giving money to charity. Um, he he was OK giving money to charity as long as giving that money to charity had some connection with, with increasing profits. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's very cynical, right? When you say that's like, uh, you know, you're not giving money to charity in some kind of altruism you know, out of the fact that I want to help you is that, oh, I'm going to give you money called charity, but it's really advertising or some other profit driven motive. That was Friedman. Yeah. It, and so that's not that's not good. The, the social responsibility thing, though, if you pull it back, it, it gets very complex because, you know, first of all, for things like charity, I mean, it'd be, today it'd be terrible if companies pull back on their charitable giving because that would be, have very serious consequences to who is receiving that today. So you, you have to be cognizant of that, even if you say that should not be the role of the corporation. If you're going to say that should be the role of government, well, you need the government that can step in into that place. But also in corporate responsibility, I think some of the things that I'm already talking about there's much fertile ground for corporations to improve their corporate responsibility outside of things like charity. We know that adolescents are experiencing greater anxiety and depression because of some of our technologies that we are rolling out. 
or are corporations you considering the media? Pardon? Are you thinking of social media or other technologies? Exactly. Um, the iPhones, the apps, how they're designed. Uh, the social dilemma documentary is interesting uh, kind of communication on that. So you have that going on. You have, um, there's a tremendous book by David Graeber, um, who passed away uh, fairly recently, but it was called Bullshit Jobs. And the thing about that book, he's not talking about like what we would call terrible jobs. We're talking about decently paid, middle class, comfortable jobs that are just devoid of meaning for the people who hold them. Can yeah. corporations do something to provide employment, to provide meaning to people? Yeah. That's corporate, that's corporate social responsibility, providing employees with meaningful work, providing goods that don't harm people, not harming the environment. I think there's much companies can and can can do in this space. The other issue, once you go too far outside, and actually Jonathan Haidt, um, who writes on ethics uh, at NYU Stern School of Business, uh, made this comment how uh, right now, you know, if you're in some Scandinavian countries and you want to bring some social responsibility into the corporation, you can probably do that because you have a society that is cohesive, generally somewhat cohesive, and, you, and so you can arrive at agreed upon desirable social consequences. Right now in the United States, there's such a lack of cohesion. It is not clear how you could get agreement on what social ends the corporation is supposed to actually work towards. So there is a political dimension to trying to create corporate respons a social responsibility. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, you'd think that people would at least unite on the principle of do no harm. Or well, maybe that's too <laughs> optimistic in the current US situation. Um, and so, so this is fair. Yeah, so at the extremes, yes. But if I have if I have Hume's name on a building at the you know University of Edinburgh, mm -hmm. that name, as I understand, was taken off because having a name on a building harms someone. Yeah. Some people disagree that that was harm. Yeah. Right. So essentially, the, the principle do no harm. People will buy, but then what counts as harm is going to be disputed by, yeah, political. Good. So then I guess this brings us on to what we can do. So, as it, so suppose that we buy your picture, which you give, where within a corporation and when there's corporate failure, typically it's not just going to be down to individuals that we can hold responsible. <clears throat> it's normally going to be a wider failure of culture, of the attitudes within the, the corporation and everything's having this sort of interpersonal effect where we can't just point the finger at a few people, it's gonna be the whole corporation or at least elements of it. Or even beyond that, as you mentioned, is where they were trained and, and those kinds of values. So where do you think blame has any sort of role at all? I mean, some people might say there's a false dichotomy here. Maybe you're saying, well, rather than punishing individuals, we should then do something else, which I'd be interested to hear what you think about that. But someone might say, well, why not both? Why not punish the individuals that you can find who are responsible, especially if they've broken the law, for instance, and also change the culture in corporations? So... <clears throat> I think it, it comes to back to being a little bit facts and circumstances based. So in other words, I think what you need to do is, you know, step one would be if you have some, some substandard behavior that you observe, step number one is you have to understand what were the causes of that behavior. And you need to do it carefully and with a broad lens. So if it was a combination of an individual and culture, then 
you might want to to actually blame both. And where that would occur, I think often is in corporations with the chief executive officer. Um, you know, chief executive officers have unique power to shape the cultures of their company or to ignore the cultures that that they've created or adopted. And so they are in a, in a particularly unique space, right? That being said, well, you know, should you blame everyone? Well, no, you shouldn't because these are cultural factors. And blaming everyone is not necessarily going to to do anything going forward. Once again, if you, you have to find out what the causes are and work towards changing those causes. Um, if if the causes are due to certain beliefs, where do people get these beliefs from? How can they be corrected? That is going to drive things uh, further than than punishment. And once again, we have to be very careful with that word punishment. You know, what does punishment give us? What is the utility of punishment? If if we all of a sudden said, well, we're not going to punish anyone tomorrow, but we're going to do the right thing from a consequentialist basis, what have we lost? I think of a thought experiment. Let's say you had a person who went around and involuntarily kicked people. Wasn't their intent, just went around involuntarily kicking people. Well, we may say, well, we, we don't want to punish them because why would you punish them? They're, it's not their fault. They're, they're, they're not intentionally kicking people. But from a consequentialist perspective, we still have a moral obligation to act. We might put that person in jail for a while, but why? Not to punish them, to protect the other people so he can't kick them, right? To protect other people. Or maybe if we put, put them in jail for a while, right, and, and help him get over his kicking, well, now we've made things better, right? Right, yeah. But sticking that person in jail for a long period of time as punishment, that's that's not really going to, I think, move us forward. So what is, so in practical terms, what, what do you think that would be good for changing corporate culture? In practical, so... Yeah, and of course, we've been discussing very broad brush, you know, philosophy, et cetera. <clears throat> if, if you want me to pick, if you want me to pick like one specific area that I think would do quite a bit of heavy lifting, it would be incentives. So let me explain this way. So let's say most corporations, a lot of corporations will have a bonus structure. And you'll be given an objective. You'll be very specific and carefully defined. And if you do this thing over the year, you will get a bonus. So let's say you're in, we'll go to accounting. And you know that if you fudge a number a little. And of course, you know, in corporations, sometimes it's so difficult to see the consequences of your actions. This does have some resonance with Enron where you place a trade. It's a number on a screen. You, you don't see the electricity being delivered. Like you don't see the consequences of that keystroke. But let's say you, you make that keystroke and you fudge a number and say, okay, if you fudge that number, um, you're going to get a hundred dollar bonus. Um, you know, if you're a moral person, you're probably not going to do that. Maybe. Okay. So let's up the ante a thousand. 10,000, 100,000, a million, a million bucks, man, your family's set, you know, you're, you're going to be able to buy that car for your, you know, your wife, just like maybe all the neighbors have, you can be able to send your kid to a good school just by hitting that keystroke or, you know, it's a slightly different thing, uh, but, but related. Let's say you have a child who's sick. Okay. Your child is sick and needs a lot of medical care. And you want to go and stand up and do the right thing um, and, and report on some malfeasance in the corporation. But you know there's a good chance if you do that, you'll lose your job. Well, in the United States, you lose your job. You lose your health care. And you have a sick, a sick child. See, some of these things go beyond the corporation. They go down to the institutions of your country. So yeah. we have a system, right? I mean, we, so think about this. We have a system in, in corporations that are almost set up 
to try and bribe your integrity. And then we're surprised when a few people succumb. Yeah, I mean, when you put it that way, it doesn't seem surprising, right? You were incentivized to do things which lead to these uh, failures. So maybe we should then like change the incentives. And so we're not trying to bribe people's integrity. And by the way, if, if someone comes uh, and says, well, no, but, you know, we have to provide these bonuses for performance. What, ha- you know, what happens if we decrease this? Well, guess what? They've done the studies. And what they have found that for jobs that require creativity or higher level cognitive function, okay, so not more mechanical things, but your typical executive type jobs, having financial targets actually decrease performance. Right. So in, the, in that case, would this be a, a tangible thing to do would be to legislate and say, get rid of these? It, it does provides the wrong incentives, it doesn't improve performance, just get rid of these kinds of incentives? Well, of course, I don't think it's quite that, I don't think it's quite that simple, but I do, yeah, Um, (laughs) but I do think, you know, if we go back to, you know, let's say, hypothetically, that we went into the business schools or pre-business school and we started to train people on values and show them the research on how these big bonuses actually decrease performance for these certain jobs, right? That, you know, I think bottom up solutions that address our values will have longer run, better payoff than some kind of, um, legislative hammer that's idealist i understand but yeah well there's nothing wrong with being idealistic uh on a podcast i think (laughs) (laughs) so yeah yeah going back to education i think that that would be a nice thing to think about as well now we're coming towards the end of the time so last couple of questions Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all do you think that business ethics has improved at all since enron this is obviously a while back now has it gotten better at all? Well, I don't want to be totally cynical. So, I mean, you can definitely look at some good stuff. You know, if you look at what's happening in corporate responsibility, some of that is good. If you look at, you know, um, uh, BlackRock came out, uh, they they managed like $6 trillion of investments. Uh, they came out, they're supporting corporate resp- uh, social responsibility. So that is good. Um you know, so there is some good things happening. But if you look post Enron, Lehman Brothers, if I follow Lehman Brothers, that, such, that case study is very similar to Enron. You know, you can point to the same things. Um, if you pick up the Financial Times over the last number of weeks, you hear about Wirecard in Germany and potential audit failure of EY, which is the same firm that had the audit failure for Lehman Brothers. If you don't, if you pick up Bloomberg, you, you'll hear about potential corruption allegations at VTOL and Trafigura, two commodity traders, the business that Enron was in. So if I had was in a debate and I, I had to take a side, I would say, no, no, things have not changed. And if you ask me, well, why things have not changed? Well, because in business, culture is largely important, hugely important. And so yeah. we, have, we have not addressed the cultural issues. So if, if you've never, if you never address, right, what is the cause of, uh, or a huge important cause of this unethical behavior, why would you expect anything to change? You wouldn't. And this is the message, right? This is the message of your work is we need to stop thinking just about whose heads to put on the shopping block and start thinking about how we're going to change their overall culture. Correct. <clears throat> Good. So, I mean, that's, that's my last question is, what's the main lesson you'd like us to learn? The main lesson. Yeah, so I think the main lesson <clears throat> would be um, something like this. Um, Aristotle was right. 
So where was Aristotle right? That our deepest desire is for happiness and well-being for us, for our families, and by extension, broader society. So if we want to increase our well-being within the realm of business ethics, what we need to do is focus less on punishing individuals and more on creating cultures that support our best selves. Great. That is a wonderful message. Thank you so much, Ken. So yeah, I'd like to uh, end on note and just say thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Ken. Great. Thank you, Graham. Take care. Thank you. And I'll just say goodbye to our listeners, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next time. The Idea Pod is produced by the Interdisciplinary Ethics Applied Center at the University of Leeds. Find out more at ahc.leeds.ac.uk slash ethics.